turn up the volume and free your mind because this is the Humans 2.0 podcast hosted by Mark Metry. What you feed your mind every day will shape your future. Listening to this podcast will strengthen your mind, thoughts, and beliefs. Leave behind the everyday mundane trivialities of your average human version 1.0 and meta-learn your way into becoming a human version 2.0 with a new upgraded guest in each episode. Enjoy. Alan Gannett is the founder and CEO of TrackMaven, a marketing analytics service whose clients have included Microsoft, Home Depot, Honda, and General Electric. He has been on the 30 under 30 lists for both Inc. and Forbes magazine. He recently came out with a book called The Creative Curve, How to Develop the Right Idea at the Right Time. Taking a look at the data and the facts, Gannett overturns the myth around creative genius and reveals the science and secrets behind achieving breakout commercial success in any field. He's spoken to amazing people like Casey Neistat and the chief content officer of Netflix, as well as the founder of Reddit for this book. This is not an interview you want to miss. If you like this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes because it helps the show grow. Enjoy. Today, I'm joined by Alan Gannett. Alan, how are you today? Hey, man. I, I, no, I am really good. And now I'm even better. I'm talking to you. How, what could be bad? I don't know, man. We'll, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so, Alan, how do you spend your time here on planet Earth? So, um, okay, well, we went right to the deep questions. Um, you know, I uh, grew up a middle-class kid in New Jersey who, um, you know, only child to divorced parents, spent a lot of time by myself. And I think my sort of coping mechanism with that was like always trying to find ways to like meet and relate to new people just because there weren't that many people around me at any time. And so I think I've sort of developed this like big passion for um, finding other people, connecting with them and trying to make them better and trying to, whether that's through a company and, you know, trying to make the people who work with me, trying to make them into the leaders I think they can be, whether that's, you know, right now I have a book coming out that's about creativity, how anyone can live up to their creative potential. I've generally found that um, I'm the happiest when I'm making other people better and living up to their potential and like forming new relationships. And so that's if I had to create like a super like meta theme to what my life is and how I spend my time, quote unquote, on earth. Um, That's that's what I have to do. This is all, by the way, Mark, assuming we're not living in a massive simulation, which I'll, you know, we'll say for now. (laughs) I I posted a video about that yesterday. I don't know if you saw Uh that or not, but. (laughs) Oh my God, this is, it's all happening. The simulation's glitching. (laughs) Exactly. So dude, Alan, um, first off, you know, we got a lot of things to talk about, but uh, I just want to thank you. You know, I uh, I invited you to come on my podcast back in uh, November, and uh, you know, you you graciously accepted, and uh, that was the time where the podcast I had like nine episodes, nobody was really watching it, and um, you know, here we are in May recording it, man. So this oh, is pretty exciting. Awesome. Yeah, well, thanks thanks for having me. Thanks for thinking of me early on, and um, yeah, I'm I'm glad to be here. Love it, man. So your book, The Creative Curve, I think it's uh, it, it's very interesting. And I guess the first question that I want to start out with, you know, before we get into the actual, you know, the good stuff, why did you write this book in the first place? Yeah. So, um, you know, my you know my company, we um, sell marketing insight software to marketers. And I always have been doing a lot of public speaking and always sort of, you know, just advocating for marketers. And w- one of the things I realized a few years ago and I started speaking about was that marketers have this misconception. Marketers have this idea that creativity is this like mystical thing that is a result of a genetic lottery. And some people have it. Some people are creatives and other people don't have it. And um, I'd always been a big reader of autobiographies and I'd read lots of autobiographies from creative greats. And that's not the story in their autobiographies. The story in their autobiography is not the result of luck. It's the result of not just even hard work, but hard, smart work, hard, thoughtful work. And so I started giving this talk a few years ago that was debunking a bunch of the sort of like 
myths around creativity and the sort of idea that it's this magical thing and talking about some of the famous stories of creativity and how there's more than what it just appears there. And that talk became really popular and did really well and people really liked it. And so that spiraled into um, a book proposal. Um, and as I was working on it, I sort of realized that this isn't just a problem for marketers. This is a problem for all creatives. Like all creatives have absorbed this sort of um, common myth we have that creativity is this divine thing. And as a result, you know, a lot of people get discouraged. A lot of people, you know, stop before they start because they say, well, you know, creativity is not easy for me. So I must, I must just not have it. And like the, the thing is like that creativity is not easy for anyone. In fact, the people who it seems easy for are some of the people who put the most work into it ahead of time. And so um, the book really came out of this, this um, almost frustration with marketers and with creatives of like, people are stopping themselves from achieving the things that I know they can literally do and that there's science that says they can do and that there's lots of studies and there's lots of case studies about this. And so the book really came out of this desire to help people achieve this thing that I know they can achieve. Like what, what, when was the moment when you were like, all right, I have to like literally write a book on this. Cause you, um, I mean, I was, I was giving the talk, uh, and I get, I was giving it a couple of times a month. And, um, I mean, every time I, I've, I've been doing public speaking since I was like, you know, 12 and, um, you know, every time I gave the talk, there was just this huge emotional response. You know, people were paying a lot of attention. They would ask lots of questions afterwards. People would come up to me. I would get emails about how impactful it was. Um, and for me, as someone who likes to to develop people, it was just this moment of, I was like, oh, this is like, this is a message that is really important and it really carries and people aren't hearing it enough. People aren't hearing it in the right ways. And they're not hearing it in a way which is backed by facts. Um, and so it just sort of had this moment where it was like, oh, wow, this is like a really great crescendo of a lot of my interests where, you know, um, I run a marketing tech company. Every marketing tech CEO writes a book at some point, like HubSpot, Marketo, Eloqua, like they all did. Um, and so I knew it was something in the back of my head I had to do at some point. Um, it was something I wanted to do. And then also it was a message that was really resonating and was really impactful. And I knew it would work really well in book form. And so those things all sort of came together in this beautiful, organic, uh, you know, nebulous soup. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And, uh, you know, I think that's really interesting when, when authors talk to me, that's, that's why I ask. So it, you know, the, the, the first thoughts that, that come to mind when you, when you say creativity is, uh, you know, something along the lines of, I think that creati creativity is this natural process that we're all kind of born with, but, um, you know, kind of ignoring through the process of ignoring ourselves and uh, moving these paths in life, going through school, it's kind of unlearned out of us. But for the most part, I think everyone has it. I think some people are definitely uh, more open than others. I know openness is a personality trait, and that is correlated with creativity. But I think ultimately, we all have like that that scale of like how creative we are. Um, but I, I don't think that everyone is like this, uh, this creative genius. I'm sure they are in their own way, but, um, you know, there's like, there's like this quote that says liberals and people that are very open start companies. They, they create the idea and then conservatives, you bring in conservatives to scale that company. Cause that's kind of a, a linear process, so to speak. What do you think about that? Yeah, I disagree. I mean, I think when you look at, so the book is broken into two halves. So the first half of the book, so basically how the book was written is I interviewed about 25 living creative geniuses. So these are people who, you know, billionaires like David Rubenstein, um, startup people like Alexis O'Hanian from Reddit, Kevin Ryan, who did MongoDB, Gil, DoubleClick, um, Business Insider, um, you know, I did. I interviewed Pasek and Paul, who were behind Dear Evan Hansen, La La Land, and The Greatest Showman, um, like a really eclectic set of creative greats. Then I interviewed um, all the leading and living scientists today who study creativity from multiple disciplines, so psychology, sociology, um, neuroscience. And then I also read thousands of pages of peer-reviewed research on creativity across the different fields. And how the book is written is the first half is debunking this idea that creativity is this mystical thing. And the second half is explaining, well, if it's not mystical, how do you get better at it? And I explain four things you can do. Um, and I use stories from my interviews about how people, other people have done them. And I explain the science of why they work. And the thing is, Mark, 
the science is like actually really clear on creativity. In fact, one of the things I think is so interesting is creativity is so misunderstood, but there's so much studies and research done in it. And basically what they found is that, and there's a, I talk about a bunch of these studies in the book, basically what they found is when you look at it in different ways, creativity and creative potential are not correlated to IQ. So there's something called the threshold theory, which is basically that above a relatively low, um, relatively average IQ threshold, everyone has the same creative potential. When you look at IQ in other ways, there's this one famous study that was done by Lewis Terman, where he took um, about 2,000 kids who tested a genius level IQs, and he followed them throughout their entire life. It sounds kind of creepy, right? But he sent them a survey every five years. And even after he died, his protégés kept sending them surveys to see how they were doing. And here's the thing. When they took this two, these groups of 2,000 kids, these 2,000 child geniuses, and followed them throughout their lives, well, they were pretty normal, like pretty normal levels of divorce, pretty normal levels of alcoholism, pretty normal levels of suicide and depression. They were also pretty normal in levels of success. In fact, of that group, these people with literally genius level IQs, um, there were no Nobel laureates. There were no people who became household creative greats, like none of these people. In fact, the only two Nobel laureates that he tested were two kids who didn't make the cut and later became Nobel laureates. And so Oftentimes, when we look at creativity, we think about it as this like thing around genius and all the stuff. And like the science doesn't support that. The science actually shows us that we all have the same creative potential. And the question is, which of us learn and develop and are nurtured to actually get that? And you sort of hit something before I think is really powerful is that when we're kids, we're all creative, right? When we're in kindergarten, we're all finger painting, we're all doing all this stuff. And so when scientists actually look at people who've achieved great creative things, they actually can trace back that there's a lot of the same underlying reasons why it led them to a career and a life of creativity, and they're not having anything to do with the genetic lottery. Oftentimes, they have the most to do with luck and circumstance and who your parents were. And so, for example, one of the sort of examples I talk about in the book is, you know, when you look at you know, people, for example, who become great artists and you go way back into their childhood, you find things like, well, um, you know, their parents, for example, were really encouraging. So, you know, when they started drawing those pictures in kindergarten, their parents, even though the drawing sucked, they told them they were great. And all of a sudden they kept doing it over and over again. They kept getting this positive feedback because, and, you know, kids want parental love. And well, at a certain point, they actually became pretty good because they were doing it so much. Or I talk about another example in the book of, you know, in athletics, you know, oftentimes we think about, oh, well, this kid was just born with these amazing skills. And really what happens usually is something like this. So let's say there's an 11-year-old girl who tries out for the middle school track team for the first time, and she is really good at track. And you're like, shockingly good. Well, you might go, well, she's never run track before. This is just, this is natural born talent. But here's what actually happened. What actually happened is when she was five, her father who loved baseball would always play baseball with her in the backyard or play softball. And so since she was five, she was running through the backyard, you know, going from base to base, you know, playing backyard softball with her dad. And so she was running. And so oftentimes you often have this mistake where we see sort of, um, this, you know, what we think of as innate talent, and really it's just skills that are transferred from something else that we did even earlier in our lives. And so what I thought was most surprising when I dove into this project was like, there's actually like a lot of consensus among researchers around creativity. Like we actually, researchers aren't that mystified by creativity. Like creativity to researchers is a learnable skill that most people have not taken the time to develop. Well, thank thank you thank you for saying that. That that's awesome. I I love it when I'm wrong, and I love when people disagree with me because it it loosens up the the assumption stacks in my head. So, thank you very much for that. Um, so, is creativity like any other skill that you unlearn? So, like meaning, um, if you're if you're like 16 years old and you're conditioned to kind of like that that scenario that you gave where like you've been on this life path where you're always learning and your, your brain is always connecting things um, and you're creative versus say 
like uh, a 70 year old that's never acted creatively in his life is it is it like any other skill where it's harder to 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 quote unquote teach that person creativity yeah so basically um it's not harder in a practical sense really i mean mm -hmm. sure there's some like age things around memory and all that stuff but like really the difficulty is actually more of just time so mm -hmm. developing creativity takes a lot a large amount of time and depending on what type of creative skill it takes a different amount of time but it always takes a lot and so the issue is that part of why you see so many sort of young talent is that you just need to start pretty young to be able to have high degrees of skill um, when you're in the sort of the peaks of your sort of producing year, so to speak. So there's this sort of correlation among youth and creativity that is mistaken for, you know, child genius, so to speak, when really it's like the fact that like in order to be great in your 20s, you probably had to start when you were like five years old. Um, and so, you know, one of the great examples of this is Mozart, who we think of as this sort of child genius. And I talk about this in the book, like that's not actually true. Here's the true story of Mozart. The true story of Mozart is when he was three years old, his father basically said to him, hey, little Mozart, I love you, but, and you should never tell a kid I love you, but there should <laughs> be no conditions on love, right? Uh, but I love you, but you need to become a great musician. And um, little Mozart was like, oh, my God, um, I just will do anything you say, Dad. And um, he said, OK, well, I'm going to get you the best teachers, the best music teachers in all of Europe, all of Europe. And you're going to practice literally three hours a day, three hours every single day. And little Mozart's like, OK, Dad, anything you say, I just want your love. And little Mozart proceeds to practice three hours, seven days a week, every single day since he was three years old. And um, he wrote, you know, there's this sort of this myth that he was like writing operas when he was four. That's not true. He wrote his first true piece of original music, original piece of music, because he's written other stuff that we later found out um, was actually really just like basically rewriting other people's music onto new instruments. But he wrote his first true piece of original music when he was 17, which you're like, OK, that's still impressive. Except one, it's not particularly good. Um, and two, um, that's after 14 years of daily three hour day practice with the best teachers in all of Europe under the conditional love of essentially a helicopter dad. And so like, yeah, like you'd be able to write something half decent after 14 years too. And so like, that's the problem is that oftentimes um, we sort of, we sort of just like assume like, Oh, Mozart, like, you know, he started writing stuff when he was 17. Like he has all this like youthful talent. It's like, no, he just started when he was three. You know what I mean? Like if you did yeah. that, Mark, like you would also be writing concertos at 17. And so like, that's, I think, one of the things with creativity is that um, oftentimes it starts so young that it's hard to realize it's still like, even though it started young, like it started with like a lot, a lot of, um, you know, study and work and development. Very well said, my friend. So, Alan, you know, you go out there, you interview all these people for your book. Now, I want to know what misconceptions um, or assumptions did you have, you know, kind of before and after writing the book? Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> oof, there's so many. Um, so, you know, I'd say in terms of misconceptions, I mean, one thing is I sort of went into the project feeling like, you know, because originally the speech I was giving wasn't as, it was more story driven than science driven. So, you know, my exposure to a lot of the science around creativity was really the first time was like you're getting into this book and there's in another life where I you know, wanted to be a professor. And so I always, I sort of like this stuff. Um, and so I was surprised by how clear the science is, like just how consistent, how straightforward the science is. Like creativity is a well studied phenomenon. So to me, one of the, the things that was most interesting, most exciting was this massive gap between the sort of academic consensus around creativity and the public perception. The public perception I actually feel like is getting worse where, you know, more and more we're holding up people like, you know, Elon Musk or Steve Jobs as these, you know, these individual creative geniuses rolling boulders up a hill. And it's like, it's like Elon Musk has like thousands of the world's best scientists working for him. You know what I mean? Like his, um, yes, he's definitely creative, but it's also like this idea that like he is a singular genius changing the world is like, a very unfair characterization. And when you look at the science, there's lots and lots and lots of science around creativity as an individual phenomenon, a group level phenomenon, a population pheno level phenomenon. So to me, that was one of the things that was just like 
the most interesting. Um, the other thing I thought was really interesting is sort of a is a double click on that is aha moments and flashes of genius. Those are actually really well studied, and they're actually like a really straightforward biological phenomenon. So basically, we have two sort of forms of information processing that our brain does. So one is logical processing, which primarily happens in our left hemisphere, which is very straightforward. It's like when you're doing math and you're doing sort of like step-by-step -step solving. And the way I like to think about this is it's like your loud lab partner. So you had that lab partner in college who's like, they're talking through every step. They're like, okay, um, first we're going to do this. Then we're going to do this. And hey, I got the answer. Go me. And then the other type of processing we do is in our right hemisphere. And this is sudden insight processing. And this is like the quiet lab partner. This is the lab partner that's like kind of mumbling to themselves. And, you know, they get an answer and they go, hey, I got the answer. And um, it's only it's only when things are sort of quiet or at peace that you can actually hear that. Um, or when the answer is so exciting that the quiet lab partner is like, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. And that's those moments of sudden insight. And those insights, it just happens that that type of processing, um, which is usually more distant or metaphorical in its nature, that happens subconsciously. So it's happening all the time, but the actual processing is subconscious. It's only once we get the answer do we actually have sort of have that aha. And it's only when our left brain is quiet enough that we can actually even hear those aha moments, which is why it happens in the shower or when you're running or all this stuff. And mm. so like aha moments, which seem so damn magical, are actually like this really well-studied basic biological phenomenon and as a result, there's lots of things you can do to actually have more of them. And so like that was one of the things I thought was sort of most fun or exciting in my research was like, you know, this is something that, you know, we think of as like this like amazing mystical thing. And actually, it's like this really straightforward, like biological process. One thing that you said that really stuck out to me was, you know, getting these aha moments in the shower. And, uh, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this. And I think it's just, you know, we we live in the age where like it's very rare to find somebody just sitting down like not doing anything you're always on your phone you're always checking this you're always talking to this person you're always talking to that so there's so many distractions your brain doesn't really have the um or it makes it hard for the brain to you know follow up this uh you know like these series of patterns and different things you've learned Whereas, you know, if you're three years old or you're seven years old and you've been doing this for like your whole life, you're kind of like set on that operating system and you're prioritizing on that thing. That's, that's very interesting. Totally, totally. And it's, um, and it, it talk about in the book, basically one of the findings that they talk about is that, you know, in order to have aha moments, you have to have mental models, knowledge, wisdom, experiences, what have you, to actually, if you're right, pro your right hemisphere to actually process. And so you actually need to have sort of spent the time ingesting. And then to what you said, you need to have those moments of sort of peace and quiet to actually have your, be able to hear your right hemisphere do its work. And so like you need solitude, you need quiet, you need your know, time where you're off your cell phone and you're just thinking. And if you don't do that, if you're constantly living in this sort of interconnected, hyperconnected ADD world, like you're not going to hear those things. Because again, it's like your quiet lab partner. It's a, it, it, it's coming up with answers, it's coming up with solutions, but it's not yelling. And if you don't give it that space, you'll never hear it. So, Alan, after you know talking to all these people and what you've learned and what the science says, how how can I be more creative? So, there's a, there's obviously in the book I lay out these four things, and so. Um, you know, we don't have four hours, so I'll give you I'll give you <laughs> sort of some a couple a couple things I think are, are particularly interesting. So, um, one is that one of the things I thought was most fascinating was across all these interviews of these creative greats I did is you know these are some people who are incredibly successful, incredibly busy, um, and yet you know we talk about creators as always like doing. And you know, we sort of talk about them always as the antithesis of us as consumers who just consume culture, but all these creators I interviewed spend huge amounts of time consuming information in a very, very narrow vertical. And this is both like upfront in their careers. Like I talked to a bunch of writers who told me stories about how like they read every book in the library. It's like, I get it. I've heard the story before. Like that was a very common thing. Um, you know, I interviewed Ted Sarandos, the chief content officer of Netflix, who literally started his career 
as a video store clerk who decided he would watch every single movie in the store. Like that was his, he's like, that's what I'm gonna use my time for. And like, so over and over again, I found that these great creators, they actually consume a huge amount of information because that's what gives the right hemisphere, the knowledge base with which to come up with these aha moments. Like we talk about you know, JK Rowling as having the aha moment for Harry Potter as this like magical thing, but it actually, well, if you spend your entire childhood um, living in the English countryside, seeing these crazy castles and spending all your time at home, um, you know, reading books and locked away in your room to get away from your parents arguing, like, yeah, you too would dream about about characters and stories and all this stuff. Um, Paul McCartney, you know, woke up with the melody for yesterday from a dream. But don't forget, he spent his entire childhood with musical family, musical parents. He literally played in a cover band. So yeah, he dreams about music and you don't. But like, that's not shocking. That's actually pretty practical. And so one of the things that you can do uh, if you want to be more creative is just ingest very narrowly, right? Don't try and know everything about everything. You kind of have to be almost a little bit maladjusted. Right? You kind of have to be obsessed with something very, very, very specific. Um, so that's one thing. But then also I found that the creative greats I interviewed, they never stop that. So sure, they maybe it doesn't become a hundred percent of their day, like you know, JK Rowling when she was a you know, she was a kid, um, or Ted Sarandos when he was working at the at the video store. But they still spend on average, I found three to four hours every day just consuming. So that's like 20% of their waking hours just consuming information so that they constantly have more, you know, what would you call electricity for these light bulb moments. And um, so I call it in the book, The 20% Principle, is this idea that even if you're successful, even if you're already creative, you still have to spend 20% of your time consuming information in your narrow little niche in order to have the raw mental ingredients to have those creative moments. And I experienced this in a meta way with writing a book. So obviously I'm like, you know, creating a book about creativity. So there's like a meta creative process going on. And, um, you know, before the book, I wasn't reading all this peer reviewed research on creativity. But then um, once I start, you know, reading thousands, thousands of pages of this research, all of a sudden when I'm on a run or when I was at the gym, like the aha moments I were having was about these like wonky concepts related to creativity. Right, that's the things I was, uh, you know, having these epiphanies on, um, and so, it, and that makes sense. And I wasn't having them before I started consuming all this material because I didn't have the stuff in there. Before I ask you my final question, where can people go to check out the book and connect with you? So, um, thecreativecurve.com, and. On there, you can link to all the retailers. You can watch the book trailer, which um, my very silly Corgi makes an appearance in. So definitely check that out. Um, you can download the preface, all that kind of stuff. And there's links to all my social. Awesome. So Alan, um, first off, you know, this show is called Humans 2.0. And uh, without a doubt, you are a human version 2.0, my friend. Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. You are, man. If you're not, I don't know who is. Um, you know, I just gotta say that uh, you know the book offers this, you know, particular perspective that I don't think is out there, and it's helping bridge the gap, so to speak, of what you touched on the the public perception. Um, so keep going, man. <laughs> I think you've got a long Thanks, way to go, dude. but um, but yeah. So Alan, after after writing this book. How have you started to curate the how, how have you started to curate your life kind of around the concepts that you've learned? How has it, you know, really changed the day to day for you? The biggest thing that for me it's changed the day to day is this sort of um, this taking down of mental obstacles or barriers around, you know, when I look at creative skills, I think I used to view them as like, well, I'm not good at that. I'm not going to try. And now I view them. I'm like, oh, no, like I could get good at that. Like the, the science shows I could get good at that. And so that actually just changes. It makes the world sort of move from 2D to 3D, where mm. when you look at the world, you see a lot more potential. And so like I have um, I have next year, I have a little goal for myself for 2019, um, which, I, which I'll tell you, but you can't tell anyone except for all <laughs> your listeners. Uh, but next year, one of my goals is I have this sort of um, this bet with myself where um, I think I want to like learn how to become a um, professional stand-up comedian. And yes. so, you know, I've never, you know, I feel like stand-up comedy is one of those yes. things that's really intimidating. 
And, um, you know, when I interviewed, I interviewed a stand-up comedian for the book and I just talked to a lot of creative people. I'm like, stand-up comedy is one of those things that, you know, is actually one of the most methodical processes. Like they're, they're very intense writers. They're very intense about their creativity. They're very, they practice all the time, but yet on stage, their whole sort of vibe is like, look how organic I am. Right. And um, that's like the opposite of how it actually works. And I think that disconnects really cool because for me, as someone who's a big fan of process, like I like the idea that there's a heavy process involved. That's my 2019 goals. I want to, by the end of the year, I've done a like a professional paid for show. That's my goal. And, um, and so that, and that's just sort of fun. It's probably just to amuse myself. Um, but that's the kind of, when you start, when you sort of get rid of this creativity obstacle, you start to sort of stop limiting yourself. And I think become more comfortable with the idea of getting better at stuff. Dude, I love that so much. Yesterday, <laughs> I tweet, yesterday I tweeted, um, one day I see myself doing stand up down the road. It's like a hundred percent what you said, a hundred percent. And I think it's, uh, you can kind of like slide in the truth, right. And use kind of humor and, and comedy to like introduce it into somebody's mind at the beginning. It's very powerful. Um, yeah, there's all this there's all this sort of process and structure to like how stand up comedians do jokes and there's a lot of process behind how they like test out jokes and the, you talk about like working out jokes and how they typically are doing that. That's why they're doing all those small comedy shows and why like the comedy seller or the comedy store like they have so many people big names coming in. They constantly have to be trying stuff out and like by the time a joke gets this special like every little facial tick is like heavily practiced. Um, and I think most people don't really realize that when they look at stand-up comedy because it comes off as so organic, but it's actually so rehearsed. Um, and so, yeah, that's my, that's one of my little goals. <laughs> I love it, man. So Alan, the final thing, I, I didn't mention this before we started recording. I probably should, but I like to ask my guests to leave the audience with a, a self-inquisitive question that they can kind of ask themselves throughout the day. Um, I, I'd love it if, if you could ask my audience a question, if you have one. You know, I think oftentimes when we look at creativity, we sort of go, oh, that's not, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be able to do that, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I would question yourself as to whether that is um, an excuse, whether that's a, mm. you sort of in the back of your head know that you could do it, but it'd be a lot of hard work. And sort of telling yourselves, well, it's easy for some people. It's not for me is really an excuse um, because the honest answer is not easy for anybody. It might look easy because part of the job of being a presenter or performer or an artist or whatever is to make it look easy, but it's not. Um, and so I think really being honest with yourself and questioning yourself and thinking like, am I using this as an excuse not to work harder? And, um, and just being real with yourself about that. Dude, I'm obsessed with that question. Alan, thank you so much for coming on the Humans 2.0 podcast. It was an absolute pleasure. And thank you, everybody out there for listening. This has been your host, Mark Metry. Thank you for listening to the Humans 2.0 podcast. There are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and you chose to listen to this. Please subscribe, share, and tell a friend about Humans 2.0 so they can improve as well. If you loved listening to that, I would love your feedback whether you're watching this on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, and anything else. Keep learning on the Humans 2.0 podcast.